welcome to Rome Elysius. It's uh, 16.25 in Athens, five minutes after the scheduled start. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would like to introduce James from Timescale, who is fearless, and he is going to tell us about fearless extensions development with Rust and PGRX. Welcome, James. Cool. Uh, please uh, ask all questions after his talk, if you mind. Yes, I will be. I haven't done it yet, but I will do it straight afterwards. No, you don't have to take pictures. Thank you. Cool. Um, as he said, I'm talking about fearless extension development with Rust and PGRX. Um, or an alternate name, I can't believe it's not C. So my name's James blackwood Soul. I live in New Zealand, which turns out is a long way from here. Um, my body has no idea what the time is at the moment, so bear with me if I um, stutter a bit. Uh, I like to work with Postgres, I like to work with Rust, and I like to work with Kubernetes, and I work at Timescale and developer advocacy. Um, I'm not going to be talking about Kubernetes today, and I'm not really going to be talking about Timescale too much today, so I'm here to talk about Postgres and Rust. That's all the New Zealand content I've got. <laughs> so I'm hoping everyone here knows what Postgres is. Um, if you don't know what Postgres is, I'm sure you're getting to know what Postgres is pretty fast throughout the conference. But I'm interested to know, a show of hands, who's heard of Rust before? Okay, so we've got maybe three quarters. That's pretty good. Um, so Rust is a programming language that's best described by its primary features. And when I upload the slides, there's a great talk considering Rust. I'd really recommend you check that out. But at a really high level summary, Rust is a modern compiled language. So what do I mean by modern? So it's, it's a language that has things like iterators and it has some concepts of functional programming. It's got a really great standard library. Um, it's a compiled language. So you compile it like C, it's not an interpreted language doesn't have a JVM or anything like that. Um, it's very heavily driven by safety by construction. So if you're doing something wrong, then it will mostly be caught at compile time. And then at runtime, you have the benefit of not having seg faults. We could do a whole talk about Rust. So I'm kind of just going to go through this fairly quickly. And if you're interested in all the nitty gritty, I'd recommend you check out the other talk. Uh, so it has low level control in the same way that C does. So it's a, a systems programming language. It has very low level control. You can do whatever you want. So if you want to opt out of Rust safety, then you can have an unsafe block and, and manipulate things however you want. It's compatible with C. So it's got an FFI interface. So we can run C code from Rust, which is very important when we're working with Postgres. And it's got amazing tooling. So there's a thing called Cargo that we'll look at shortly. Um, it manages packages, it manages build, and it manages testing. And it's just, it's a first class citizen of Rust and it's its the best package management slash boot tool I've ever encountered. And also it can run inside Postgres. So that's probably important for me, but perhaps not so much for the people that developed Rust. So what about PGRX? How many people in the room have heard of PGRX? Cool, slightly less, but still really high. Um, I think this is one of the things about this conference. I was speaking at the Extension Ecosystem Summit yesterday, or the day before yesterday. And four of the six talks actually mentioned PGRX. Um, it seems to be a bit of a shift. People are starting to use it. So what is PGRX? It's a framework for Postgres, specifically a Rust framework for Postgres that lets you develop extensions. So. It basically has an automated way of taking some components of the Postgres API, wrapping them automatically, and then exposing them via safe Rust code. So it removes many of the opportunities you'd have for crashing your database or corrupting your database because you're not doing the right thing in C. Um, PGRX code's compiled and it runs close to the speed of C. It's not always exactly the same, but that's not really the goal. So it's many times faster than code you'd get from PL Python or PL Java or PL Go or whatever else you want to use. Um, it helps out with your development process. So if you're creating an extension, then it's got some really great tooling that we'll look at that sort of helps you develop extensions, helps you test extensions, helps you run extensions, helps you package extensions. 
<clears throat> and in my opinion, PGRX makes high performance Postgres extensions more accessible. So it, it, it's really, for me, it's equally about safety, it's equally about developer experience, and it's equally about making things more accessible for people that might not know how to write C. So a little bit of history of Rust in Postgres. There's a guy called Benjamin Fry. I think he works for Salesforce. I'm not sure if he still does. Um, he came up with this thing called pgextend.rs in 2018. Um, it, it was pretty much the same, like you can write Rust extensions in C. Um, around about the same time, Jeff Davis, I believe, did a something called Postgres extension.rs. It was kind of like a conference POC. I, I think it might have been used internally at Microsoft. I'm not, not too sure. Um, so they were both like, I suppose, the genesis of the idea. Then this guy, Eric Ridge, who goes by ZomboDB online, showed up and he had a goal to be able to use Rust in Postgres really quickly because he wanted to rewrite his product, ZomboDB, which is Elasticsearch indexes in Postgres. And he really quickly got to work. He decided to start his own project. At the start, people were kind of skeptical. Why aren't we just using the other projects? But the man is prolific. So he he managed to thrash out a version in a year that was actually quite close to what it is today. Um, in 2021, other companies started using PGX as it was at the time. Uh, so Timescale, my employer, started writing stuff called the Timescale Toolkit, which are functions, hyper functions, which are in Rust. Um, Postgres ML, I think, ported from Python to PGX. And it was transferred, the ownership was transferred from Eric himself to TCDI, which is a company that was employing him and actually a whole bunch of uh, Postgres developers at the time to work on PTX. Mm -hmm. And then in 2023, TCDI donated PTX, the name changed to PGRX, and it became part of the Postgres Foundation. And between the start of 2023 and now, which I suppose is a couple of years, the adoption's really picked up. So there's people using, I'm not actually sure what for, but I know there's people using PGRX at Microsoft. Superbase, so like heavy users, they have something called Superbase wrappers that wouldn't have been possible without PGRX. AWS on RDS has PL Rust, which is backed by PGRX. Uh, Parade DB have based their whole product line around using Rust and PGRX. Tembo have uh, some Rust extensions like PG Vectorizer. Uh, Neon have some products to do with AI, which are written with PGRX. I like this um, group of, of elephant logos here. Uh, Diablo uh, have PG Anonymizer, which is written in PGRX. Crunchy released an extension in PGRX the other day, um, which I thought was really interesting because Crunchy, uh, up until now, just releasing things in C, and now they've got an extension in PGRX as well to deal with Parquet files. So it's it's really from my perspective, it's really taking off. Um, in the early days, it was hard to get people to look at this thing because people were really skeptical, but now you can see by the type of companies that are using it, it's, it's really clicking off. We just need Google in that lineup and we've got all the hyperscalers. So I would say that things got good around there and hopefully you all are gonna get involved around about here. So what does PRX, PGRX actually get you? Like, what are the benefits you get from PGRX? You get a fully management, managed development environment. Um, we'll look at this a bit more later. Uh, you can do things like create new extensions or templating, scaffolding. You can install them or you can create, a, sorry, and it lets you create, it installs a version of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in your local environment. Then you can inject your extensions into it and run it with PGRX run. Uh, we'll look at this in the demo. You can use PGRX tests to run unit tests on all your code. So everything's fully unit testable if you want to. And you can also package stuff up to ship it off production. So I can say, I want to compile this extension. I want to compile it for this PG config setting and it will work out where things should go. Create you a tarball you can extract onto your, your database server's root and things will just work. It lets you target multiple Postgres versions, which is something that I mean, obviously you can do in C, but it's it's something you have to do for yourself. So it supports from Postgres 12 through to Postgres 17, um, all from the same code base. You can use Rust feature gating to target specific APIs. So definitely for 12 and 13, there's like a whole bunch of stuff that changed. We moved to the later versions. You can still access those APIs if you want to. 
and you can seamlessly test against all the versions. It does automatic schema generation. So one of the big problems with making Postgres extensions, actually, who's made a Postgres extension before? Yeah, so a bunch of people. What, one of the interesting things is you, you write the code. If it's C, you have to compile it. Then you've actually got to go and make the SQL to make that code work and put that into the database, put the shared library in the same place, craft your extension file. PGRX does that all for you. So you don't have to do anything other than writing your Rust code and then running the cargo PGRX command. So it will generate schemas for you or inject them into the database or do everything that you need to do. Um, and you can also include custom SQL if you want to. Safety first is obviously a big thing. That's one of the, the reasons that this is written in Rust and not some other language. Um, interestingly, I saw there's a, a PGZX now, which is the same kind of thing in Zig, which sort of optimizes for speed rather than performance, uh, rather than safety. Um, so we translate Rust panics into Postgres errors. So if something goes wrong in Rust, we're going to abort the transaction. We're not going to X the database. Um, the memory management follows Rust's drop semantics. So if there's an object and it's dropped, even if there's a panic or even if Postgres crashes, we're going to do the right thing before we bail out. Uh, we've got first-class user-defined function support. So you can just annotate a function with pgextern. PGRX will expose that to Postgres. You'll be able to create extension. You'll be able to run your function. Um, you can return set of iterators. You can return table iterators. You can create trigger functions by annotating with PG trigger. We'll sort of look a whole bunch of this stuff in the demo. Uh, you can create custom types. So you can even create custom types from things that aren't really something Postgres would know about. So I can take like a Rust struct, which has a whole bunch of things in it. I can say, I want to use this in Postgres. It will serialize that down to Seabor, which is like a compressed JSON-esque kind of thing. It will store that on disk, and when I read it back, it'll appear as JSON. Um, it does all that transparently. So I don't actually need to go and make types for things manually. It just does it for me. If I want to have a Postgres enum, I can translate backwards and forwards between Rust enums, which is really great. And I can make composite types if I really want to. And then there's a whole bunch of more advanced features. Mm -hmm. So I can have safe access to SPI, which is the server programming interface. So I can run queries from within my code. Um, I can use memory context in a safe way. So if anyone's done any C programming, memory context is uh, something which can, can be quite difficult to get your head around. Um, we've got safe access to them here. So that, that's the overall theme. It makes stuff safer and it makes stuff easier. Uh, we can do hooks into the executor, to the planner, transaction, subtransaction hooks, um, also log, I mean, whatever hooks Postgres has got, PGRX, in theory, can have access to. Um, we can safely use Postgres-provided pointers. So Postgres gives you a pointer. In PGRX, you can use that in a safe way, so you're not just blindly assuming that pointer is going to be valid. You can access a logging system. You can do unsafe things. So if you want to opt out of the safety, you can put stuff in an unsafe block and, and do whatever you want. You can have background workers, wall decoders, use shared memory, many, many, many things that we're not going to get through on this talk. I suppose the point is that it's, while it's not feature complete, it, it maps across a very large part of the Postgres API service. Some stuff that I suppose isn't supported, which I would love to have supported, um, uh, things like table access methods, index access methods, there's people working on those at the moment. Foreign data wrappers are supported, but through the Superbase wrappers project, that should hopefully be pulled back at some stage. So this is what a really simple PGRX function looks like. Um, literally, this is all it is. You can just put this code in and then compile it, which we'll do in a second. Um, so we're importing stuff from the prelude. If you haven't seen Rust before, this is what Rust looks like. Um, we're running PG module magic, which is something that you run in C functions as well. And then we've got a hello world function that returns a string, doesn't take any input. And we put a PG extern on that. And that means it's going to be exposed through to Postgres. So I suppose one of the big questions is why not just use C? And I'm going to answer this now, then I'm going to come back to it later. Um, so you, if you're using PGRX and things compile and you get them into the database, then you, in theory, won't have any seg faults, buffer overflows, null pointers, data races. Um, you get a powerful type system that you wouldn't otherwise have with C. 
You get a unified build system for your extensions. You get dependency management through Cargo, so you can pull in many, many, many extensions that we'll look at later. And I think you get wonderful ergonomics. So it's it's for me, it's a really great developer experience. So how did I start with PGRX? So this is not so much to talk about myself. It's to show like two different angles of people that use PGRX. I, I would not call myself a developer. I used to be, uh, um, before I worked at Timescale, as a database architect. Um, before that, I worked in pre-sales, actually. So I, I write a lot of code, but I would never call myself a developer. And I certainly wouldn't call myself a C developer. So I have never had the rigor around making sure that I don't have seek faults and I deal with memory correctly. I used to write hacky code in Python. I really wanted to write extensions and I wrote some in PL Python, but I hadn't used C professionally, obviously. So when I discovered I wanted to do some things that you can't do from PL Python, my only option at the time was C. I had a go at that and it, the experience was was quite horrifying, mostly because of my background. Like as I said, this isn't something I've done professionally and I found it really daunting. Um, I found Rust about the time PGRX was starting. And all of a sudden, straight away, I was able to write extensions. I was able to compile them. If they compiled, I knew they wouldn't bring the database down, which was like a really big thing. Before it was like, I'm going to make an extension and it's going to compile. Then I'm going to put it in the database. Then it's going to get a seg fault and the whole thing's going to fall over. And I can't really do that in a professional context. So that was my journey. I suppose that's from like someone who's not a C developer. Um, Timescale's journey was a bit different. So Timescale built Timescale DB. Timescale DB is in C. Timescale DB employs many people on the database team that are professional C programmers. They then decided to write the Timescale toolkit and also a PromScale extension in Rust. And I think a lot of that was about development velocity. Um, a lot of that was about getting stuff out the door really quickly and being able to support stuff really quickly. Uh, it was about having a great standard library in Rust. It was about being able to pull stuff in via cargo. And then after that, we continued to add features to Timescale DB in C. Then we came back and wrote PG Vector Scale in Rust, which adds indexes to PG Vector, which was primarily about being able to get it out the door fast again, being able to use the Rust standard library, being able to pull in a whole bunch of crates. And then we continued to, and we will continue to do Timescale DB features in C. Timescale DB will never be written in Rust. I don't think Postgres should ever be written in Rust in case someone wants to ask the question. But there's a time and a place. So if, if, if under certain circumstances, I really think that Rust can live alongside C. Um, no matter how experienced you are, I still think you can get something out of PGRX. So I've got some quotes here. I, I sort of polled people in the PGRX community and went and hassled some people with some quotes. Uh, so Damien, he's the co-founder of uh, Delibo. He moved his Postgres anonymizer extension to PGRX recently. And he wrote a thousand lines of C code in a few weeks without knowing Rust beforehand. Which, to be honest, is quite a big thing. Look, Rust has like a notorious learning curve. Um, it can take a long time to get up to speed compared to other languages like Go. Um, but he's basically come along. He knows how to write C and he's rewritten his extension in Rust. And for him, it's it's about development, improved unit testing, really great libraries available in Rust, and also saying goodbye to seek faults. So he sees making extensions as a responsibility not to crash the server for your users, which I suppose is a big thing. If you're going to put something out there and ask people to put it into their Postgres instance, then you want to be pretty sure you're not going to corrupt their data. Also for the Postgres community in general, because they're probably not going to blame your extension. They're going to blame Postgres, and it's going to be an overall negative experience. Uh, this guy, Will Mune, I don't really know much about him, but he reached out and said, PGRX has been a joy to work with. Um, he had some custom types and a planner hook, so that's deep within the C internals. And it took him less than two months to convert a thousand lines of C to Rust. He added a ton of new features. He ended up with 4,000 4, lines of Rust, but 2,000 lines of that were tests, and he didn't have tests previously at all in his C version. Not that he couldn't have, it just made it easy to do it in Rust. So he added a whole bunch of features, doubled his code base, and then had 2,000 lines of tests on top of that. Uh, Matt is the founding engineer at Timescale. So he wouldn't be able to release PG Vector Scale as quickly without PGRX and Rust. 
And he gave a number that he thought it was five times faster to use PGRX than it would have been to use C. And this is the guy that wrote Timescale DB proof of concept. He was the architect involved with all of the Timescale DB major features like compression, which are right in the internals of Postgres. Paul, the CEO of Superbase, said just PGRX is awesome. They wouldn't be able to have post, uh, Superbase wrappers without PGRX. This other guy, Matt H., um, he said he could sleep at night not waiting for a hidden C-based seg fault, which is kind of the same angle I was going for. So I'm going to do a demo now. Um, we'll see how it goes, because I managed to trash my environment before. But um, hopefully it works out. So first of all, this has been kind of murdered by the screen changing. But um, I don't want to run this live, because the internet here is pretty flaky. <laughs> but if I, rest I can install this thing called uh, Cargo PGRX. So if I, I'm not going to run it, because the internet is not great. But if I ran Cargo install Cargo PGRX, then it will inject this PGRX cargo plugin into my Rust cargo environment. And then I can run cargo PGRX to run specific cargo PGRX commands. So what I've done here is run init. It's downloaded Postgres 12.2, 13.16, 14.13, 15.8, 16.4, and 17.0. It's downloaded them, which took a very long time at the hotel. <clears throat> then it's untarred them. It's configured them. It's compiled them and it's installed them in my local system. Um, normally it takes on my laptop like, I don't know, 10 minutes. It does them all in parallel, but um, it took a very long time. And it was quite fraught with me wondering if I was going to have anything to show at all this morning. So after I've done that, um, I can do a bunch of cool things. So I can do cargo PG RX status. And it will show I've got all these versions of Postgres. So I've got a couple of them running. A bunch of them have stopped. Um, they're installed in my .pgrx directory. I can say cargo pgrx new. So we want to call something hello world. Then I can go into the hello world directory and have a look at what it's made for me. And I'll get some Rust code that kind of looks about the same as what we had before. Maybe I'll go down here and I'll change this to pgconf.eu there. And then I can say cargo pg rx run. It'll compile that code. Um, sometimes Rust can be a bit slow compiling code, so hopefully we'll get there. As I say that, it happens straight away. I got a lot of the, the artifacts caged, so that's probably why. So it's dropped me actually into a Hello World database with PSQL. It's compiled my extension. It's found the function. So you can see there's one function found up there. It's injected it into this instance. I can do create extension, Hello World. And if I do a DF, you can see I've got this Hello, Hello World function. If I say select... What's it called? Hello, hello world, I think. Then it says hello pgconf eu. So that's basically it's incredibly easy to get going, is the takeaway there. I can also then say cargo pgrx run pg16. And it'll do the same thing. Better than it'll throw me into a Postgres 16, and I'll have the extension ready to go. And then I can make sure it works. If I didn't want to spend that much time, I can actually say cargo PGRX test. It'll compile, and then it'll run some tests. In this case, the test's actually going to fail. And if we come back in here, it's because we made that change to pgconf eu. So if we come down here, we can see that it's just running a test. It's been annotated with PG test. <laughs> and then it's asserting that hello, hello world is what comes out of it. So if we were to change that to pgconf.eu, actually spell it right, run it again, and that test will pass. So you can see you can put tests right into your extension code. You don't need to have them in a separate place. Um, 
one of the gentlemen that replied before. So obviously he had 2,000 lines of tests, so he was doing really thorough testing. Some people choose not to have them all. Kind of depends on what you want to do, but I, I would suggest having tests in the same place is, is obviously great. So if we come back over here, and I've got a bunch of other directories here ready to go. So if we go into this max directory, let's look at something slightly different. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So there, this is actually defining an aggregate. So has anyone ever made an aggregate function in Postgres before? A few, we're getting down the down the lean end now. So when you make an aggregate function in Postgres, it's, it's like a three or four step. You've got to make the function, define how it flows through the aggregate state. If you use PGRX, it kind of just does that for you. Um, so we've got a struct here. We're saying it's an aggregate. We're saying that it takes an input of a I32, so an int, and have an output of an I32. Then we've got this state function, and we're basically just running standard comp on the current value and the incoming value and returning it. So again, if we were to run that, Sorry, some stuff in there, but we can do select max pg rx. Mm, I think num from I've got a table here called numbers. Hmm. Ah, okay, I've still got that old <laughs> the old project over there. If we do select max, then it will come back and give us the max function. Um, just to give you an idea, so obviously when I say it's close to the speed of C, there is a little bit of overhead there because we're like switching between languages. So to give you an idea, if we run, um, I've just got a, a benchmark here, which is based on PG Bench. So if we have a look at compare max and SQL, I'm, I'm literally just running max from PGX and max from uh, the Postgres core. Obviously, the max function is like a single instruction when you compile it down to assembly. It's not really doing that much. So this isn't really testing how fast that max item in Rust is, which is the same. It'll compile down to the same thing as in C. It's testing what the overhead of PGRX is in terms of running many, many items. So if I now run benchmark. Oh, didn't seem to be right. The first time it runs, if, if I load it as a shared library, it would work. Oh, okay. That seems a lot higher than I thought it should be. Um, so when I ran this the, this morning, it was a lot closer. Um, it was sort of four and six. I don't really have time to work out what's going on there. I think it's because it's loading the library each time, so the first call's a bit slower. Um, so normally you would see four milliseconds versus something like six milliseconds. So, I mean, that seems like a big amount. That's obviously a much bigger amount. Something's going wrong there. Um, so you would see maybe 50% slower. But that's like worst case scenario, right? The more work you do in your aggregate in Rust, the closer things are going to be. Um, if you want ultra, ultra, ultra high performance, you could still use C. If I was to do this in SQL, then it would be a lot longer. So if we come back into this directory, then see how much time we've got left. If there's another one here called BG Worker. So if we were to come in here, this is sort of getting a bit more complex now. So if we have a look in here, <coughs> we're importing PGRX BG Workers, which is actually something I contributed to PGRX. This is a shared library, so we have to inject this in as a, as a shared preload library. We're doing, we can create a background worker. So we've got this thing called background worker builder. Um, we're setting the function we want to run in our background worker. We're enabling SPI access so it can access the database and then we're loading it. And if we come down to the background worker function, so it's not great when I have my terminal at this size, but we're attaching signal handers to the background worker. We're connecting the worker to SPI using the Postgres user. And then the background worker is going to loop doing something every 10 seconds or when it's woken up by the latch. Um, I think in this case, because we've attached sig term and sig hub every time there was a sig hub. So anytime the config changed or anything like that, it would actually wake up as well. 
And then when it, when it actually gets in there, it's going to start a transaction in the database. It's going to connect with SPI, and then it's just going to select star from hello, hi, howdy. And then it's going to basically, for each tuple that it returns, it's going to get the greeting datum by name and then log it to the log file. So what we're actually going to want to do is compile that. Um, I'm actually going to go out, then we'll have to... So inside here, we've got a data directory for each of my Postgres instances. So we'll need to open up the conf file. It would be good if it could do this for you. It's like the last bit of manual stuff you had to do. Maybe someone could help commit that. Uh, so I'm going to add into my shared preload libraries that I've got this BG worker that I want to run at load. I'm going to run this again. I'm not going to bother creating the extension because that wouldn't do anything. The background work is already running. Uh, then I can do tail minus f dot pg. I think it's 16 dot log. And you'll see every 10 seconds, the background worker will wake up and say some stuff. Um, if you were to write a background worker in C, it's obviously very doable. There's lots of great extensions, lots of great templates out there to show you how to do it. I would argue if you don't know anything about C, it's going to be pretty hard to do, though. Um, it's not super well documented. You kind of have to look around the source code to look what's going on. Um, I think the ergonomics here are far superior, especially for something that's a bit more complex, like writing a background worker. So moving on. Um, I've got this other one here called semver type. Okay, if we quickly change back here, there's a Postgres semver extension. Um, it's pretty in the weeds, so I'm not going to go through all this, but you can see there's quite a bit of stuff happening here. It actually has the implementation of semver inside the extension. Um, if we go down, this is probably quite small right down the bottom. This is how you expose the functions. So you have to say PG function info, send verse send, and then you can define them. They've got a whole bunch of things to find. Uh, I think there's really a couple of functions you can use and the rest of them is just a send ver type that gets injected into Postgres and then it's got all the operations for that type. Is something greater than, is something less than. If we were to go back in here and think about how that might work with PGRX, it turns out it's basically this. So we're making a, this is really, no, yeah, we're making a struct. The struct is called semver. Inside the struct, I'm wrapping the version attribute from the semver crate, which is like an external crate I'm pulling in. Uh, and then I'm just saying, I want to create some in out funks. And I want to say, this is basically just so I can say, rather than trying to serialize the semver object, the semver structure we've made, I want to get in there and do it on the inside part of it. So that's, I don't know, I think this in out funks, but we could probably optimize away if we wanted to. Um, but basically it's what, like 24 lines of code with a couple of empty lines. If we were to run that, And we can do select. Uh, I'm just trying to think what would work. So if we do 1.0.0 dash alpha is greater than 1.0.0. 1. 1 so that's just a string. It'll say true. But if we cast this one to a semver type, which I've just made, then it will say false. So through using the Rust crate ecosystem, we've basically managed to, it's not doing everything the other C implementation does, but it's got a long way through pushing out, knowing about Semver to an external crate that's maintained by other people. Obviously it's strictly versioned, so it's not gonna suddenly jump to another version. You don't need to worry about that. Um, we're gonna do one more and then we're gonna move on. Um, so we go to sum of square roots. Have a look at this code. 
We actually have this thing called sum of square roots, which is literally just doing the sum of square roots for uh, a number of numbers. And then we've got this other one here called parallel. Rust has this thing called rayon. Uh, so we basically make something parallel just by saying into parallel iterator. Um, I'm not going to run this one because we're running out of time. But basically, when you run it, you'd see that it's going to be parallelized. Uh, I think my laptop has eight cores, so it's going to do it over eight cores. It's going to be eight times as fast. Um, this is more a talking point for something we're going to go to when we come back to the slides. Um, there are some other features that... Oh, sorry, button. There are some other features that we don't have time to talk about. Um, you can take that code and then you can wrap it up into a tarball and deploy it to another server. It, it does a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, but moving on. Uh, so here's something that uh, ChatGPT made for me. It's meant to be a Rust person talking to a whole bunch of C developers. Um, and the message there is perhaps I forgot to read the room. So this is the internals track at a Postgres conference. Um, there's probably quite a few people who are really experienced with C. What would they get out of PGRX? I think I've explained that. Um, but more importantly, what changes to Postgres could help out PGRX? Um, and one major thing is threading. So threading in Postgres is just dragons all the way down. Um, I don't want to advocate for making Postgres multi-threaded. I think that's a, an argument that other people can better have. I don't really have an input on that. But what I would really like to see is that Postgres uses pthread sig mask instead of p sig proc mask, which are both POSIX calls. Um, they're to do with the way signals are handed. They have an identical API. There's not really any difference between using them, although I'd love to talk to anyone that knows more about this than I do. Um, so the use of sig proc mask is actually unspecified in a multi-threaded environment. Um, whether or not that's strictly uh, undefined behavior or not, I haven't managed to get someone that knows a lot about POSIX to tell me. To me, that pretty much sounds like it is. Having said that, there's a lot of people that are running things in C and in Rust with threading in Postgres. As long as they don't run any Postgres, anything that acts as the Postgres API from the threads, then it's fine. Um, I wrote a patch for this a long time ago and I kind of dropped the ball, um, didn't push it through. So I'm hoping to push that through. But I'm really interested to talk to anyone that sort of knows about this stuff, if there's anyone here. And also Postgres needs you. And perhaps if you know C, it's not you, it's other yous. So if someone's PG curious and they want to become a contributor to Postgres, then at the moment, the only path really is that they learn C they learn Postgres internals, and then they become a contributor. And there's a bunch of people, I know Robert Haas is doing something in Discord. Um, there's a bunch of people that are sort of focusing on this path and trying to get more people to become Postgres contributors. It's quite a high barrier to entry. Learning C, learning about the Postgres internals, learning enough about it that when you submit a patch, you are actually submitting something that's sort of worthy to be talked about, and then getting that into Postgres, that, that's quite a hard path to go down. Um, I would argue a lot of people when they're Postgres curious are Postgres curious because they just want to get something done. So perhaps if they could then do what they wanted to do via Rust, that's then exposing them to the Postgres internal. So you're still learning what a memory context is, even though you're using Rust. I think that those people, maybe not all of them, but at least some of them are still going to want to become Postgres contributors. So I'd certainly know a lot more about the Postgres internals that I knew before I started using Rust. Um, I certainly have more of an interest in how things work in Postgres. I'm, I've started writing things in C, even though I can use PGRX, because there's some things that I, I might just want to write in C, and also I'm more interested in it. It's, it's sparked my interest. So I think something like PGRX, which is close to C, is definitely a path to getting more people into the project, more people contributing to Postgres. But just to be clear, I'm not advocating that Postgres should accept code written in Rust. I don't think Postgres should be rewritten in Rust. But I think it's, it's a great other path to have for extension development. Cool. Thank you. That's me. Um, happy PGRXing. If you want to give feedback on the talk, that's the QR code there. And I would love to have some questions.
How do you distribute the built extension? Does the receiver have to have a cargo built environment or is there a packaging that I uh, know so yeah I can run I can run cargo pgrx package and then I can give it a pg config file that's not necessarily the one I'm using on my system it'll build it against that pg config file and then it'll make a tarball that will then if I un untar at the root of my build server it will just put stuff in the right place so you don't have to there's another project, PL Rust, which is about having a, a trusted Rust language that needs a build environment. PGRX is kind of on the other side. It thinks that database servers shouldn't have Rust on them because, in my opinion, it, I, I don't know, I, it, it makes me really uneasy. So no, you don't have to, and yes, there is a way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, I've got two short questions. One is, is it supporting the uh, utility hooks? Uh, it is supporting some of them, but I don't think all of them. So I think the log utility hook is supported. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of pulling in. For the utility hooks, they're pretty easy. So you just need to pull in the code. Um, if you were to show up in the Discord channel and say, I'm interested in supporting this other hook, then yeah, it, it would be trivial. The, the planner ones are a lot harder. Okay. And the second one is, how was your ex how is your experience with debugging and how do I know if some functionality is not supported? Okay, so my experience with debugging was basically the same as it would have been with C. So again, I'm not an experienced C developer. I found myself leaning towards putting in things that print out comments and debugging like that. Um, I have seen people attaching debuggers to the Rust code inside in the same way you would with C. Um, you can definitely do that. I can't do that. I would love to do that, but it's not been something I've had time to focus on. Um, what, what was the last part of the question, sorry? Uh, how would you know that certain thing is not supported yet? Like, uh, it's connected to the debugger. If yeah. I get a certain error from the C... The C um, yeah, so that's actually a great question. So the the way it works is there's this thing called bind gen. So it binds the, the C definitions to the safe Rust definitions. If, if that hasn't been implemented, you won't be able to use it in PGRX. You can't hit like a surface of an API that hasn't been covered because it just won't be available and you'd have to show up and say, I'd like this to be available and it will get pulled in. So there, there's no dark corners really. Um, it either works and it's there or it doesn't work and you need to implement. Thank you. Okay, uh, many thanks uh, for your talk. And the question is, if uh, you have really high load the database with sub millisecond latency, so do I understand right that you should be really careful with the uh, Rust extensions because, I mean, okay, your test can be, I mean, some corner case, but as far as I understood, you paying the, I mean, some is uh, some simplifying development with the performance, right? Added um, latency. So at timescale, we use them for what we call hyper functions, which are functions that run over large amounts of timescale data. We often see better performance than we would if we wrote them in C, just because the Rust standard library often has better performance when using stuff like iterators. Um, there's definitely some, uh, there's a small amount of overhead involved with calling across the FFI boundary. Um, so in the background, PGRX has to handle stuff like um, when Postgres jumps, when there's an error, it has to handle that. It has to make sure that it's watching for panics. And there is a small amount of overhead. I've never really come across a situation where that's an issue, but if you were doing sub millisecond kind of stuff, I think you're going to have to watch whatever you do in Postgres. That's always going to be a concern. I mean, if you're in a situation when the even just that statements have visible impact on the latency. Yep. So in this case, I mean, it can be. Yeah. I mean, anything that you attach to the database is always going to have an impact on latency if it's a hook. Um, I mean, in general, so on the one of the last slides, you shown this, uh, the map. Okay, uh, imagine you're in a position, you're just in a curious. I mean, you can go either learn Rust, either learn C. Yeah. And I mean, and ideally create some good uh, extension that, and I mean, in some future contribute to the uh, Postgres itself. Is it worse to learn Rust while it's, I mean, supposed to be yeah. slower? That's actually a great question. So I think, the question I'm hearing is, is, is the overhead of learning Rust higher than learning C? And is that something I should actually do? Because I know learning Rust is hard. I could just write this in C. I think that depends on the person. Personally, I find it a lot easier to learn Rust. I don't think that's the case for everyone. 
some people were probably going to be able to learn and see in the internals just as easily. If you have a background as a C developer and you're happy doing the memory management yourself, you're happy avoiding seek faults yourself, then I would encourage you just to go down that path. Um, but I think, I think each individual person needs to choose the best tool for them. And what I've seen in the community is there's a lot of people that probably, including myself, are, are just not going to write extensions that run in production in C. I, I'd, I'm sure I could get there eventually, but I'd need to focus on it for years before I got the muscle memory to be able to make sure I was managing memory correctly. So I'm happy to pay a small overhead for Rust to make things safe for me. I see some questions, but unfortunately we are running out of time in this talk. So please ask James after the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.